Today I'm continuing my teaching entitled The Believer's Authority. And we are now into our fourth tape or the fourth teaching lesson in that set. Uh, actually, I'm still teaching on with authority comes responsibility, but it was just going so long that we divided this into two different tapes or two different teaching sessions here. And today we will begin with with authority comes responsibility part two. Now, I've already talked about that the authority and the power that God has given us as believers puts responsibility upon us. That means that if we don't use our God-given authority and we ask God to do what He told us to do, it's not going to get done. And I've used two examples so far. I've talked about healing. People are asking God to heal them or to heal others when the truth is the Lord said He put within us raising from the dead power And then He gave us a command to go out and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. It is wrong, incorrect, for us to pray for God to heal us or another person. Instead, we need to believe that God has already done it, stand up, take our authority, command it, and make those things come to pass. Now, I know that this raises a lot of questions, and it may sound like the things I'm saying are so off the wall so different than what you've heard that you just reject them without giving them a due um, you know, audience and really paying attention to what I've said. But I've got plenty of information on this. Our website has this. You can call our helpline. They will give you other teachings that go along with it. But there is a wealth of information I've got on this. But what I'm saying is absolutely true. It's wrong for us to pray and ask God to heal. He didn't tell us to do that. He told us to heal the sick, not pray for the sick. The second example that I used was talking about salvation. And most people are praying and asking God to save their loved ones. And that's not how the Bible says it happens. The Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that we get born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If people don't hear the Word of God, they aren't going to get born again. Prayer is not going to make people get saved. The Word, the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's what gets people born again. And so we have got to share the truth with people. And so I taught about what is the right way to pray for a person. So we've talked about that. Today I want to go along with something that is uh, similar. It's kind of the same logic, but just a different application. I want to make the application so that nobody misses this. And um, I know that there's going to be some misunderstanding over this. I've had some misunderstanding in the last month or so about this. Some of my very good friends have challenged me on this and... uh, you know, I'm not contentious. Let me. I'm just saying these things in advance so that you won't um, write me a bunch of hate mail and stuff because I'm going to counter some real sacred cows here. But you know what? I, I have some people that differ with me on this, that I'm friends with them. I love them. I respect them. And uh, I don't believe that they're of the devil because they believe differently than I do. But I am very firmly convinced that these things are true. And that's talking about praying for revival. You know what? I agree that revival is needed. And you could define revival a lot of different ways, but if you are talking about where people are in love with God, where there is a freshness, a vitality, an excitement about God, the miraculous power of God is in manifestation, people are being healed, delivered, saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, our churches are full. People are turning back to God. If that's what you're talking about when you say revival, well then, zero complaint here. I agree, we need revival. What I differ with people over is how you go about getting it. And it's basically being taught today that the way to get revival is to plead with God, to bombard heaven, to grab hold of the horns of the altar and just shake it until God comes out. You are making God pour out revival. And I disagree with that 100%. Again, this is the exact same logic that I was using when I was talking about praying for a lost person. Instead of trying to plead with God and get God motivated to save this person, I want you to know God is more motivated to send revival than you are. God wants this nation to be revived 
and following Him and yielded to godly principles more than you want it. I guarantee you, you are not going to get God motivated in somehow or another up to speed with you. That's not what it's about. And yet much of what's being said about prayer for revival is all about us pleading with God and pouring out our heart and begging God to send this. And actually, uh, the intercessors that are praying for a revival are the ones that get a tremendous amount of credit because if it wasn't for them, God would just fold His arms and let the world go to hell. He doesn't care. It's the intercessors that are causing Him to turn. They're saying, repent, turn. Oh God, turn back to us. I believe that the logic for this, and please don't misunderstand, I've been in that group. I've been where I begged and pled with God for revival. So, you know, I I have been in this situation. I am not saying that the people who are doing this are all wrong. I believe many of them are seeing the need for it and they are so desiring to see this poured out that without thinking about it, they've just fit into the model that has been given. But many times they are pleading with God to pour out His Spirit and they have this logic that God has so ticked off because mankind has moved so far away from what He wanted us to do that God has turned His back to us, has His arms folded like, man, I have given you over. I'm just, for, forget you. And they kind of see God with that kind of an attitude. And what the intercessors are doing is pleading and saying, Oh God, please have mercy on us. Oh God, please uh, don't impute our sins unto us. Oh God, please have mercy. And they're begging and pleading with God to turn back to the human race. Boy, I'm going to say some things here that I know are going to really uh, <laughs> cause some problems here. But you know what? That is not a New Testament prayer. Let me share a passage of Scripture with you. Boy, if this doesn't uh, light your fire, nothing will. Out of, uh, I believe it's 2 Timothy. Excuse me. It must be 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's talking about prayer. and It talks about praying for kings and all that are in authority, etc. And then in verse uh, 4, it says, "...who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus." You know what this is saying is? That there is only one mediator. A mediator, by definition, if you look it up in the dictionary, means a person that stands in between two parties who are at odds with each other, and you are seeking to reconcile these two opposing parties. That's what a mediator is. And you know what? In the Old Testament, it's true that there was a gap between God and man. Sin had separated. And so in the Old Testament, you saw mediators stand up. I'm not going to take time to turn over there, but in Genesis, or, uh, Galatians chapter 3, this exact terminology is used of Moses saying that the Old Testament law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. It calls Moses a mediator. Moses stood between an angry God and a sinful people. And Moses stood and said in Exodus chapter 32, he says, Repent, O God, and turn from your fierce wrath. That's a strong statement. God was told to repent by one of his creations. You know, that's hard to understand, but that's exactly what Moses said. And the more amazing thing is, in Exodus 32, I believe it's verse 14, it says, and God repented. God responded. Moses was a mediator that stood between an angry God and a sinful people, and Moses stood there and said, Repent, O God, turn from your fierce wrath. Did you know that that worked under the Old Testament because God was angry, sin had separated people from God, and there was a judgment to be paid, etc., and it was appropriate for Moses to do that. But in the New Covenant, Jesus became a mediator for us. It says that in Hebrews chapter 7 and a number of different places. And this right here says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus forever stood in between a holy God and an unholy people, and He paid for our sins, took away all of the wrath and the punishment of God, not only temporary until the next time that you sin, but He paid for sin, past, present, and future. Jesus has forever reconciled an angry God with an unholy people, 
and has now brought them into union and into harmony, and whosoever will can receive this goodness of God. Jesus has forever done that so that if Moses was to stand today and say, Repent, O God, and turn from your fierce wrath, that would be anti-Christ. It would be standing against what Jesus has done. It was appropriate in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't come. Now Jesus has come. And if we stand today and say, Oh God, repent. Don't pour out your wrath on this city, on this nation, on these people. Oh God, have mercy on us. And if you are trying to take the place of Jesus and accomplish what He's already done, that's Antichrist. I don't believe any of you want to be anti-Christ, but I believe that the way that the church has basically been praying and pleading with God has literally been against what Jesus Christ came to do. And I believe the lack of understanding this is what has caused many people to pray for revival the way that they do. Now again, let me stress that I am not against revival. I am all for revival, but I don't believe it comes by us begging God for it I believe it comes by us recognizing that God loves people more than we love people. God wants us to be revived more than we want to be revived. And so instead of begging God to pour out His Spirit and passively just waiting on you know, a lightning bolt out of heaven to fall and cause people to start filling the churches and things to happen, What we need to do is praise Him that He wants these results more than we want it, and then we need to start taking our faith and using that, release our authority, and start going out and preaching the gospel. If you go out and raise somebody from the dead, you know what? You'll have all the revival you can handle. I really believe that. And some of you are thinking, well, but you can't raise a person from the dead unless you already have revival. See, I disagree with that. I don't believe it's God who's holding back and hasn't released the flow of His Spirit. I believe it's the body of Christ who's clogging up the pipe and keeping God from flowing. And so what you need to do is work on your pipe. You need to work on yourself. You need to say, Oh God, forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me that I'm not doing what the Word says. You said that we were supposed to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. I'm asking you to pour out your Spirit and these things to happen without me. I'm just asking you to move sovereignly. God, forgive me for that. And instead, you get up and take the Word, begin to meditate on it, and you start seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears open, people raised from the dead. You'll have revival. I guarantee you, if you see all of the sick healed so that your shadow touches them and they get healed the way that it happened in the Bible, they'll go to breaking holes in the roof and letting the sick in. They'll, there'll be so many crowds around. You'll have all the revival that you can handle. See, again, this is not the mindset of most people. I am for revival. I am a revivalist. I am seeing people revive. Millions and millions of people's lives are being changed. But I'm just not asking God to do it. What I'm asking is say, God, I know you want to do it. Lord, help me to be the vessel that I need to be. So I yield myself and I pray and I fellowship with God so that God can make me what I need to be. And then I go out and speak the Word of God. And I command healings and I see miracles happen. And we are seeing revival. We are seeing people revive, not only in America, but around the world. I get emails daily from India and Africa and different places. People around this world's lives are being changed. Not by me begging God, but God wants to do it more. God is, it's not God up there with His arms folded saying, beg a little harder. Get another 100,000 people to pray. And unless you fast twice in the week, I won't do it. No, it's not like that. God is up here with His arms out trying to release His power, saying, is there anyone who will believe me? Is there anyone who will stand up and just begin to start speaking the Word and living the Word and demonstrating the Word? And see, if you will do that, you'll have all the revival you can handle. You'll see people's lives begin to change. I'm telling you that the way a lot of people are praying and begging God as if we have no influence, no authority, no power to make God's kingdom come to pass here on this earth, and we just go to God as a beggar, Oh, God, please move. Oh, God, please have mercy. Oh, God, please touch us. I tell you, that's useless. And ma- Well, let me rephrase that. It's probably not useless. It's accomplishing something. It's accomplishing a lot of negative stuff. 
It's making us bitter and angry about why hasn't God moved? How come God hasn't poured out His Spirit? Why has God let this go on? Why did God let this person die without them being saved? It's not God who's letting this happen. It is not God who is letting America go to hell in a handbasket and get to where we are more and more and more ungodly. It's not God that has made America basically a post-Christian nation. It's not God who hasn't poured out His Spirit. It's His people that have been begging Him to do what He told us to do. We haven't taken the Word of God. We haven't been operating in our authority. We have shirked our responsibility in trying to throw it all back on God and ask God to pour out His Spirit. You know what? That is not the model that you see in the New Testament. I just challenge you. If you can find an instance in the Bible where Jesus told the people to pray and plead with God to pour out His Spirit and to heal people and that there would be a great move of God. Find an example where Jesus conducted His ministry that way. You can't find it. Find an example where the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter asked his people to pray and intercede and tear down Diana of the Ephesians in Ephesus and to come against this stronghold. That temple was one of the eight wonders of the world and they had over a thousand priestesses who had sex with the men as they came into worship. Man, they filled out the place. (laughs) It was packed because of that. That was part of their worship. And Paul, instead of getting in and trying to do anything political, instead of trying to get the church together to pray and bind and plead that God would stop this worship, and instead of doing spiritual warfare and binding Diana of the Ephesians, you know what he did? He preached the gospel. And he told them, Diana of the Ephesians isn't anything. This this statue that fell from Jupiter isn't a, it didn't fall from Jupiter. There isn't any God. There's only one true God. This is what he preached at Corinth when he was there, you know, talking about all these multiple statues and stuff that they had. What he did was preach the truth. And God took the truth to set people free. He didn't organize intercessors. He didn't have people do spiritual battle. The things that are being done today by the church to try and change our nation are not the things that were commanded in the Word of God. In the Word of God, they went in and they preached the Word everywhere. They walked and demonstrated the power of God. And as people saw the Word of God in demonstration, the Holy Spirit bore witness that this was truth. People repented and converted And the temple of Diana of the Ephesians in Ephesus fell into disrepair and the people forsook it because they turned from her to God, not because there was some spiritual warfare being done. And when people got converted to Christianity, the temple fell into disrepair and Diana of the Ephesians hasn't even been a factor for 2,000 years until the intercessors resurrected her about two years ago and claimed that she was the great power behind the Muslim religion. You know, I know that there's many of you upset with me and I am rocking your boat. But I, I, again, I challenge you. Show me in the Word of God where you go in and you send people into foreign countries to do nothing but pray and tear down strongholds. Forbid them to preach the gospel. Don't let them witness because they might be censored by it. They might be punished. There there might be some persecution. See, that's what's being done today. We are sending people into foreign countries, spending millions of dollars to let them just prayer walk and pray. Don't preach the gospel. Don't witness. Just pray. There isn't a scriptural model for that. There isn't. I've studied the Word many, many times, and I've never found it. There may be something that you could try and pervert and twist into that, but I mean, if you just take the Word and believe it and read it, I don't believe you can find that scriptural model. You know what you can do is you can find a scripture where they prayed and said, Lord, grant unto us that we may speak your Word with all boldness, that signs and wonders might be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Acts chapter 4. You can find them praying, God, help me to be bold. You can find Paul saying, help me to preach the gospel with all boldness. Pray for me that I will have all boldness and that I might make known the mysteries of God as I should. You can find them asking for prayer for that. You can find them praying, you know, that they won't be moved by the persecution and things like that. They can pray for the favor and the grace of God, but they aren't praying 
and asking God to just sovereignly pour out His Spirit without them witnessing and doing their part. There isn't a scriptural example for that. And basically, that's where the church has come to today. And that's the reason that the church is not having the salting influence on our generation that we're supposed to because we aren't going about it right. God gave power to the church. And with that power came authority and responsibility. And we haven't used our authority. We aren't preaching the word. We aren't speaking the truth the way that we should. And that's the reason that people's lives aren't being changed. And many people have rejected what they've heard because it wasn't the true gospel. It was just religion. And it was condemnation. And it wasn't what God intended. And so there's many people that just lumped everything together and rejected it because they could see this evil in it. I tell you what, the church needs to preach the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. I tell you, there's some people that all of a sudden light's beginning to come and you're beginning to recognize why you've been praying for 20 and 30 years for a person to be saved and they aren't saved. It's because you haven't shared the word with them. You aren't telling them the truth. You need to pray laborers across their path. It's not God who's letting them go to hell. It's us because we haven't been preaching the gospel and sharing the word. How can they believe except they hear? How can they hear unless somebody preach? How can they preach except they be sent? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost and the people had asked him and they said, what, what must we do to be saved? So let me turn over here and read this. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 here was Peter's response. Peter spoke unto, uh, said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise, and the promise that he's talking about is the outpouring of the Spirit, which I believe anybody would agree is a part and parcel of a revival. It says this promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You know what he's saying here he is, he says that what you've just seen, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous things that that caused, this is not only for you, but it's for your children and unto them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You know what he was saying? This is for you, it's for your children, and he was looking forward through the generations and he was saying this is for the people in the year 2004. You know what? God never quit pouring out His Spirit. This was poured out and it was intended to go from generation to generation. It's unto all believers. Now in some ways people have seen this truth. You know, used to when the beginning of the uh, Pentecostal movement happened back at the Azusa Street in the early days, of the Pentecostal movement, they didn't fully understand why this manifestation of the Holy Spirit came. They didn't understand exactly what they did to occasion it or if they did anything to occasion it. And so one of the dominant doctrines that was prevalent in those early days of the Pentecostal movement was that they would just pray and beg God to pour out His Spirit and fill people with the Spirit. And they would just wait on this, I mean, cataclysmic, experience where God would touch people and they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now before I get into saying any more about that, let me just say that, you know what, there were some good things about that. Uh, today, many people just come forward and they've never even heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you say, would you like to receive? And Well, I guess so. And so they pray, don't even know why they need the Holy Spirit. They don't know what to expect. There is no anticipation. There is no desire. And because of it, I've seen people receive prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, walk back, and it seems to have zero impact on their life. Now, that's a negative, and I don't believe that that's the way it should be. One good thing that came out of people just praying and being desperate and wailing and travailing and waiting years for the Holy Spirit is that when they finally received it, it meant something to them, and it had a profound impact on their life. So there may have been some good come out of it, just like there's some good that comes out of the way people pray today and beg and plead with God for the outpouring of His Spirit. But I believe that most people would recognize that you do not have to wait and tarry for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, Jesus told His disciples that in the first chapter of the book of Acts. He said over here in Acts chapter 1, He said um, in verse 4, yeah, I'll go down to where Jesus started speaking in that verse. He says, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, ye have heard of Me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Jesus told His disciples to wait, to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. I admit that. But now the Holy Spirit's been given, and you don't have to wait any longer. If you're going to take this admonition to wait... And if you go over to John chapter 20 where he says, go to the city of Jerusalem and wait, if you're going to follow this instruction and think that you have to tarry to receive the Holy Spirit, well then to be scriptural, you'd have to go to Jerusalem and tarry. See, that's not what it's saying. This was tarry for them because it was going to be approximately 50 days until the Holy Spirit was poured out. But now that the Holy Spirit has been poured out, you don't have to wait any longer. You can believe and receive. And I have seen thousands and thousands of people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues, have a life-changing experience, and they just simply believed and received. You don't have to wait and tarry. Now, I agree. I believe that most people would agree with what I'm saying. But then when it comes to revival or the outpouring of the Spirit, they just shift gears and go back, oh, we've got to plead. We've got to get a million people praying together for revival and an outpouring of God's Spirit. No, you just have to believe. You just have to receive. And as you get revived, then you revive your little influence that you have, your family, your friends, workplace. And then they get revived and they go out and it just spreads. The reason we aren't seeing a greater revival isn't because we don't have millions of people praying for revival and pour, asking God to pour out His Spirit. It's because we have very few people that are flowing in revival, that are believing, that are standing up, taking their authority and making the power of God manifest. That's the reason we don't have more of a manifestation of it. You know, I heard a man speak, Duncan Campbell, who actually preached the Hebrides revival. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it was a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit over a hundred years ago. And Duncan Campbell talked about how there were two little women who prayed for 20-something years. Then there was a pastor and his seven elders that prayed for months, nearly a year or more, I think, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And eventually, one day, the power of God hit, and they began to describe all of these things. And as they told how it happened, they said it was by begging and pleading with God for 20-something years. But then years after I heard that testimony, I heard the testimony of a young man who showed up, and they had prayed every Saturday night for over a year, begging God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this Saturday night, this young man walked in. He prayed until 2 o'clock, and finally he says, either God's Word is true or it isn't. He says, I'm leaving. We got it. I'm going home. And you know what? The revival actually came when they quit praying and started believing and believed that they had it. That changes things. Amen. You know, when we were given power and authority by the Lord, we have to use what God has given us. And if we don't, then it won't get done. You know, I've used this example before. I've taken a person sitting like on the front row of a meeting and I've handed them my Bible. And so here they are with my Bible in their lap. And then I say, now what would I do if this person comes up and says, Andrew, please, can I borrow your Bible? I've got to look up a scripture. I really need to hear from God. I believe God is speaking something to me. Could, would you please give me your Bible? They could beg. They could plead. They could try and condemn me into it and say, if you were really a Christian, you'd share your Bible with me. But you know what? If I've already given it to them, what am I going to do? How do you respond to somebody who is asking you to do something that you've already done? Well, pro I mean, I don't know how you respond. Probably I'd just look at them and would be dumbfounded. I probably wouldn't say anything. It'd probably be just total silence because if you're asking for something that you've already got, how does a person respond to that? Probably in silence. Very similar to the way that God has responded to all of our pleading for His outpouring of His Spirit and all of these kind of things. 
The truth is, as these scriptures I was using in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, God poured out His Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He's never withdrawn His Spirit. He's never gotten so ticked off that He just said, All right, Holy Spirit, come back. No more revival. No more manifestations. It wasn't God who caused the church to go through the dark ages. It wasn't God who willed that there be a period of time where the truth was just, you know, so bound up. It wasn't God who just all of a sudden sovereignly reached down and touched John Luther, or excuse me, not John Luther, Martin Luther, and just all of a sudden poured out his spirit and began something new because after all, he was tired of a thousand years worth of deadness in the earth and he just finally decided he'd do something. No, it's not God that does that. You know what? Martin Luther was in the Catholic Church He had a real heart for God and he wasn't being satisfied by the religious teaching and doctrine of his day and he was literally climbing up these steps at the Vatican doing his rosary praying thinking that going to the Vatican, the holiest place on the earth would make all of the difference and he finally just got fed up with it. The Lord brought back to his remembrance Scripture, Romans chapter 3 verse 27 that says, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So then we understand that a man is justified not by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith. Martin Luther heard the word. He believed it. Martin Luther got up and acted and put his thesis up on the door. He stood boldly at this um, diet of worms, I believe is what they called it, where he gave his defense And Martin Luther proclaimed the Word of God and the Word of God acted like wildfire and spread and these denominations uh, sprung up, independent denominations from the Catholic Church. And we saw a reformation and the world was changed not because God just sovereignly says, all right, I'm, I'm ready now to do something in the earth. It was because a person finally got hold of the things of God. See, again, religion preaches that God just moves in waves. And back during the 40s and the 50s, there was the healing movement that came through the body of Christ. And so there were the healing revivals and all of these things that sprung up. And then there was the charismatic movement. And then there was the word movement. And then there was this and then that God does these things. That's not the way that God is. God doesn't just pour out a little bit of healing here and a little bit of joy here, but until you pray harder, He's not going to move again. No, God is like this, trying to get His power out. You know why the the healing revivals sprung up? Somebody began to start studying the Word and saw in there, and they stepped out and believed God, and they started releasing this power into the earth using their authority. Now, I'm not familiar of everything that's gone on in the body of Christ, but I did read like Oral Roberts' uh, autobiography. And I remember that Oral Roberts, and I forget the exact time frame, but I think it was in the 40s, Oral Roberts was hearing reports about healings and things, and certainly you weren't seeing this in the normal church. And he got hungry, got to studying. He got convinced in his heart that it was still for us today. See, the church had taught that those things passed away with the apostles, that miracles don't happen today. And that was the dominant theological position. Well, he got convinced that God did it, and Oral Roberts just stepped out, and in his own biography, he rented a hall... I'm not sure the, I think it was in Enid, Oklahoma, but anyway, wherever he was, he rented a hall and he basically just said, God, if this is really you, I've got to have some proof. I've got to know because there was very few people that were believing these kind of things. So he asked for three things. He says, God, if this is really you, there's got to be so many people there at the meeting. So he was behind the uh, stage. He looked out through the curtain, and before he even went out on stage, he counted the people to see if there was that minimum number of people, and there were more people than the minimum number he had given. So then, instead of doing a song service and all these other things, he just went out on the stage and, first of all, took up an offering because that was his second thing. He says, God, I'm not going to go in debt. If this is you, you are going to have to bring in enough money to pay for the... uh, equipment, the rental of the hall, all of this. And so he had a minimum amount. He went out, took up an offering, counted it, and I think it was nearly to the penny what he needed. So the second requirement was met. The third one was, he says, God, if this is really you, 
then I'm going to pre- preach and proclaim that it's your will to still heal today, and we have to see one, at least one notable miracle. And so he preached his sermon. He called people forward. He saw one or more notable miracles. And from that time on, he was convinced that this was God. And Oral Roberts started going out and praying for people and proclaiming and doing the Word of God. And you know what? A revival ensued, a healing revival. And people think, well, God just sovereignly moved. No, God has been wanting to move through revival and miracles ever since the days that Jesus was on this earth. He said that if you believe in me, John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. You could debate what the greater works are, but what are you going to do with the part that says, The works that I do shall he do also? See, God always intended for His church to operate and flow in the supernatural. It's not God that just skipped from about 100 or 200 A.D. until 1940 something and didn't do miracles. No, it's people that quit appropriating it. They got into unbelief. They quit operating in faith. Finally, some people, and I know that Oral Roberts isn't the only one, but they broke through that barrier. They started preaching and proclaiming the Word of God, and when they took their authority and used it, then God moved. And if they would have been receptive, not only would the healing have manifested, but there would have been a righteousness revival, and there would have been all of these other things. And the entire counsel of God is available to us. God isn't wanting to just move for a decade in healing, and now he's forgotten healing. And those of you that are sick in this decade, it's not a move of God. <laughs> he's, he's not wanting to move and heal you anymore. Now he's working on marriages. And then the next day, decade, he's going to get into emotions. And then the next decade, he's going to do this, and there's a new wave coming. That's just man's attempt to justify our powerlessness. I'm telling you that Jesus is all today that He ever was. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's wanting to move in your life in miracles, healings, deliverance, prosperity, everything that God is. He's wanting to move in your life, and you don't have to beg and plead and then just passively sit back and wait to see what God's going to do. What the Bible calls that is unbelief. The scriptural way, the faith way, is to believe that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that He honors those who honor Him. That He uh, respond. You have to believe that God is, and that He is a um, rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so, Father, I'm diligently seeking. I'm going to have those things. I believe You've provided it. And when you begin to seek and build yourself up, boom, the power of God will fall, and you can operate in all the revival that you want. It's you that determines how much revival you have, not God. You don't have to just pray and passively wait and then say, well, I've been waiting for 20 years for revival and we haven't got it yet. We don't know why God hasn't done it. That's just as wrong as a person who's saying, I've been praying for 20 years for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but God hasn't given it yet. No, God's already given the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You haven't received it yet. It's not God's giver who's having the problem. It's your receiver that's the problem. You need to work on your receiving, not God's giving. Here's another area. Look at this. In Genesis chapter 1, it says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Notice in this 28th verse, God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now this is something that is so simple, I shouldn't have to say it, but I've met people that don't understand this, and it's a great example of this whole principle I'm talking about that God gives us power and authority, and it's our responsibility. What I'm talking about here is the Lord blessed us and gave us the ability to procreate. He blessed Adam and Eve, and He says, You be fruitful, you multiply, and you replenish the earth. God told us to do that. And you know what? If you want to have a child, the stork doesn't bring it, God doesn't bring it directly. I'm sorry if I'm affecting your 
<laughs> understanding. If you think that babies come by the stork, you're going to have to go ask your parents or somebody else, but that's not how they come. You know what? God gave us the ability to create children. Now, am I saying that God isn't involved in this? No, it's all God's power, but He set things in motion, and I can guarantee you this. You can pray until you're blue in the face, and you aren't going to get pregnant until you have a relationship with a man. That's the way that God intended that this operates, and that's the way that it works. And you know what? If a person was just praying and praying and praying to get pregnant and have a child, and yet they had no physical relationship with a man... You know, we would look at that and think, how dumb can you get and still breathe? Didn't anybody ever teach them the facts of life? Don't they understand how things work? And yet, you know, this is exactly what people are doing in other areas. They're asking God for healing, but they aren't doing what the Word said. The Word says, speak to your mountain. In uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. That's one of the laws of God. And yet people, see, aren't doing what the Word says, and then they're wondering, Why hasn't God healed me yet? Well, that would be just as foolish as a woman who prays constantly to get pregnant, and then nothing happens, and she says, Why hasn't God caused me to have a child yet, and she hasn't had a physical relationship. See, God gave us power and authority in this area. And let me just spin this around and look at it from the other direction. You know what? I've known some people. I'm thinking of one person right now who had 12 kids. And uh, the reason, you know, I asked him, I said, man, how many kids are you going to have? And his, his theology was that if God wants us to have kids, we'll have kids. It's just totally up to God. Now, I, I do admit that there are certain forms of birth control that I don't advocate because I believe that actually their abortion is what they are. So I don't advocate any and all types of birth control. But if nothing else, you know what? A little self-control would help you in this area. Amen. And... Uh, you know what? If you don't exercise some self-control and control this, just thinking that, well, if it was God's will, we'll have children, but if it's not, we won't have children. See, that is totally ignoring this thing that God blessed us and gave us power to procreate. Let me say it this way, that if you never had children unless it was God's will, if all children were just supernaturally ordained of God and God wanted you to have them, then you know what? People who are prostitutes, who are unwed mothers, who have children illegitimately would never get pregnant. Because I can guarantee you it's not God's will for people who aren't married to have children. If it was just totally up to God, if God just directly blessed us with every single child, then unwed mothers wouldn't be getting pregnant. Prostitutes would not be getting pregnant. People who are going to bring children up in homes where they're, they're conceived and they're birthed uh, addicted to drugs and with HIV and all of these kind of things, those things wouldn't be happening if it was just God directly controlling this. No, God gave power to procreate to physical human beings. And if you put those laws into motion, if you cooperate with how God created this universe to function, you can create a child. Now, that's not to say that God isn't involved. It's God's power, but I'm saying it is under our control. You put those laws into motion, and even unwed mothers will have children. Now, I think that most people, all except these few people that have 12, 15, or 20 children. Now, again, if you want that, I don't think that that's sin or it's not anything wrong, but I'm saying a person who just believes that God only it is the only way that you get pregnant. It's just totally up to God whether you conceive or not. Now, those people may have trouble with what I'm saying, but most other people will recognize that, you know what? There is a law here. We have power and authority in this area, and if you want results, you've got to do the right things to cooperate with those laws to conceive children and have children. Most people understand that, and they would ridicule and think it's weird for somebody to just pray for a child to appear, for God to just supernaturally drop a child out of heaven. And they know that that's not how it comes. Well, this is what I'm saying about all of these things. That's not how healing comes. 
That's not how salvation comes. That's not how the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and revival comes, is by you just praying and then boom, God sends revival. God sends healing. All of a sudden, a person miraculously got saved. No, there are laws. There are things to do with our authority as human beings that we have to cooperate with. And if we don't cooperate with God in these areas, it will not come to pass. You know, that is so simple, what I'm saying here, that you have to have somebody to help you to misunderstand it. And yet we've had a lot of help. I've talked to many, many, many people who said, you know, if God is really God, then he could have healed this person. Why did he let them die? He could have done this. See, God's not like that. God doesn't just say, all right, you have power to heal. You go out and heal the sick. And then because we aren't doing it or because we are more dominated by unbelief than we are by faith, God doesn't just look down and say, well, you know what? These people are never going to get the job done. And so I guess I'm just going to, even though they aren't believing, even though they aren't doing it the way I said, I'm just going to heal this person anyway. See, that would violate his own integrity. God told us, you have the power. You go out. You heal the sick. You cleanse the lepers. You raise the dead. And if we don't do our part, God is not going to do what he told us to do. And no amount of begging or pleading is going to change that situation. And see, this is why things are going the way they're going is because the body of Christ doesn't know, first of all, what has been given unto us. We don't know what's under our control and authority. And we aren't using it. We are shirking our responsibility. We're operating in unbelief. And we have all of these religious doctrines that absolve us of responsibility and say, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. It's just up to God. God chooses who gets healed. God chooses who gets saved. God does all things sovereignly. And we back out of our responsibility and place the blame back on God. It's not God who's failing. It's us who's failing to take our responsibility and do it. Let me give you another example of this. I'm just going through and making some applications to trying to drive this point home. But in Deuteronomy chapter 8, here's another example of this. In verse 18, it says, Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant, which He sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. This verse says God gives us power. Anytime God gives power, He also gives delegated authority so that you can release that power and use it. And so here it says He gives us power to get wealth. God doesn't give you money directly. That's not what the Scriptures teach. Again, I know I am just... It seems like every time I open my mouth, I'm stepping on somebody's theology. I deal with a lot of people, and I know that this is not the way that the average person thinks, and you just may be in a constant state of shock But the scripture doesn't say God gives us money. What he does is give us power, an anointing, an ability to get wealth. That's what God gives us. First of all, God doesn't have money. God doesn't use money. In heaven, there is no currency of exchange. God doesn't make money. If you're saying, oh God, I need $100 or whatever currency is that you need, If you're saying, oh God, please give me these pounds, these lire, whatever it is, and you're praying for that, God doesn't have any of those things. And He's not going to counterfeit them. That's against the law. God's not going to break the laws and start counterfeiting money. He's not going to make money and put it in your pocket. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. God gives you finances through people because he doesn't have money directly. He's not going to counterfeit it. He's not going to make it. He's going to impress people and people will come to you and people will be a part of this supply. Again, it's amazing how people are just ignorant of this truth and so they pray and say, God, if you're God, you can do anything. Put money in my wallet. And then they open their wallet up. And if there's no money in it, they say, well, God's not faithful. The word doesn't work. The things that say that if you pray, you'll receive, it's just not true. And then they start blaming God because they are just ignorant. You know, I hate to be so blunt, but I don't know how else to get these points across. I mean, it is just absolutely stupid. 
some of the things that people are believing and the way that they are blaming God and responding, it comes through absolute ignorance. God is not going to create money and put it in your wallet. That's against the law. He wouldn't do those kind of things. God is going to give you power to get wealth, and then you have to cooperate with that. And there are, I'm just going to mention a few of these things. There's, I'm not trying to teach on finances. I'm just using this as an example. But one of the things that God said about finances is that He would bless what you set your hand unto. He would give you a hundredfold return and multiply the things that you do. Did you know if you are doing nothing, if you are sitting at home and not working a job, a hundred times zero is zero. And you aren't going to see God begin to prosper you if you aren't out working. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I believe it's verse 18, that if any doesn't work, don't let him eat. God is in to work. God is into you doing something. The whole welfare concept is not a godly concept. Now, I am not saying that any person who's receiving welfare is ungodly. I'm not saying that God hates you. I'm not saying you're in sin. But I'm saying that's not God's system. That is not a scriptural system. Anybody could need help on an occasion. Anybody. And there's nothing wrong with you taking the help of other people or a government if you are in a situation where you temporarily need it. But to be a first, second, third, fourth generation welfare recipient where you just sit home and let the government pay you for doing nothing is an ungodly concept. If you're going to get into God's divine flow, He gives you power to get wealth. And then you've got to start doing some things to release that power and see this anointing begin to generate the income that you need. One of those things is you need to do something. You need to work. You need to set your hand unto something. I've had people before come to me. I, I can think of one guy who was a partner of ours and at one time was a big giver. He was a CEO of a corporation. And then his corporation downsized and he got laid off. And so he started drawing welfare, unemployment. And he took that for a period of time. And he put in resumes. He wanted to work. He put in uh, resumes all over town. But he was really overqualified. And it was in a depressed time. And so because of it, Nobody was hiring him. And he came to me, and he was just a few weeks away from his house being repossessed and him losing everything. And he says, what do I do? And I said, go get a job. And he says, I'm trying. And I said, no, I mean, go get a job. Like, until there's nothing wrong with you believing for a CEO job and believing for a good thing. But I said, until your, your better paying job comes in, go work at Walmart. Go work at, at uh, McDonald's. Get a job flipping burgers. And this guy was highly offended. I'm a CEO. I couldn't do something like that. And he says, I've got, besides, I've got to have more money than that. My house is about to be repossessed. He was four or $5,000 behind. He hadn't worked in over a year. And I said, you know what? If you would have been flipping burgers for a year, you would have had enough money to keep this house from being repossessed while you still sought these other jobs. I said, there's nothing wrong with you not wanting to stay there, but you've got to do something. If you are doing nothing, you are advocating your responsibility and you are keeping the blessing of God that He wants to give you from manifesting. And you can pray and pray and pray and you might get a miracle that will just tide you over that will keep you going, but then you're going to have another crisis next month and next month and next month. You aren't going to see the supernatural divine flow of finances begin to start manifesting in your life until you recognize God gave you power and authority to get wealth and you need to stand up and use that power and authority by doing something. Man, that is just as clear as a bell to me. And yet it's amazing how many people are waiting on their ship to come in and they never sent one out. <laughs> Amen. You're waiting on a crop to grow up and you haven't sown any seed. You're believing God for a great supply. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You're using a little tiny thimble, throwing God a five bucks here when the truth is the tithe off of your check would be two, three, four hundred dollars, and yet you're giving five bucks here and five bucks there, thinking that you are really being generous. 
and you're wondering, how come my finances aren't coming in? I'm praying and believing God for prosperity. God said He would give back to you with the same measure that you used. If you use a thimble, He's going to use a thimble to give back to you. And if you need a bucket full of finances, it's going to take a long time for God to measure that back to you with the same measure that you gave out. See, this is the way that the kingdom works. I know that the things I'm saying are super simple to people who have understood this, but brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the body of Christ doesn't act like they understand the things I'm talking about. They're just praying and wondering, why hasn't God done this? And you aren't cooperating with the things of God. God doesn't give you money. He gives you the power to get money. And then there's things you have to do to release that power. One of them is set your hand unto something. Flipping burgers is better than getting welfare. And if somebody says, well, I'm actually making more money off of welfare than I could flipping burgers. But you know, the difference is God can't bless welfare. He can't multiply welfare. He can begin to multiply flipping burgers. He can promote you to the manager of that thing. You could meet somebody who could give you a promotion, who could offer you another job. But when you are doing nothing, you're hindering the power of God from flowing in your own life. It's not God who fails to answer our prayers. It's us who fails to take our authority and use it properly. That's what we've been talking about. You know, the last thing I want to talk about today is about deliverance, about seeing Satan flee from us. Over here in James chapter 4, in verse 7, this scripture says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, this is another area where God has given us power and authority over the devil. Let me just read a passage of scripture to you about that. I've already used this verse before. But in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. This scripture says God gave us power and authority over all devils. All devils. All means all. That means that there are no demons excluded from this. God gave us power and authority. But yet I meet people constantly who are saying, well, the devil is doing this to me and the devil is doing this and I know that the devil has stopped this. And if you know that the devil is your problem, if you would just believe and take your authority, then you've solved the problem. Because you've got authority. If you know that the devil is your problem, instead of going and saying, oh God, please get the devil off my back. Oh God, the devil is trying to cause me to do this, etc. You aren't going to get free from Satan's harassment by praying and asking God to remove the devil. This scripture says, James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It didn't say he would flee from God. He will flee from you. It is God's power, but that power is in you, and God himself is not going to come down and make the devil flee from you. You have to resist the devil. The word resist means to actively fight against. That's what the dictionary defines it as. Resistance is an active thing. You've got to stir yourself up. You got to you got to get mad. You know, recently I taught a series on anger management. I talked about a godly use of anger. The godly use of anger is to be mad at the devil, to be mad at sickness, to be mad at disease, to be mad at poverty. You got to stir yourself up. You can't tolerate it. As long as you can tolerate something, you will. But when you get to a place where I've had it and this is it and you rise up with that anger, I guarantee you there is a spiritual dynamic released when you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired and you put your foot down and you resist the devil. He flees from you. You know, Satan at heart is a coward. He really is. He's a bully. He intimidates. He yells. He threatens. He says all of these things. But the truth is he's a coward. I don't know if you've ever been around many bullies, but I, you know, growing up, I guess most kids saw there were bullies in their school that always tried to take advantage of other people, manipulate and control them. And I learned early on that if you stand up to a bully, that you know what, they'll leave you alone. They'll respect you. I mean, you might even get beat up. You might even lose a battle, but you know what, you'll only fight one time and that'll be it. They'll respect you after that because a bully at heart 
does not want to fight. They just want to intimidate and control. And if they realize that every time they come around and try and do something to you that you're going to stand up and fight, even if they win the fight, they don't want that much effort. That's the way Satan is. Satan really is a coward at heart. He just tries to intimidate and dominate people. And you know what? When you get angry and you resist the devil, he's just like a bully. The moment he knows that it's going to cost him something, that, man, you are going to stand there toe-to-toe in the name of Jesus and go at it with him, you know what? Satan will flee from you. But you've got to resist. Do you realize that saying, Dear devil, please leave me alone, is not resisting. (laughs) I actually had an example where there was a woman who had made these packs and had actually drunk urine of other people and made these demonic packs. I mean, it's amazing what Satan can lead people to do. And she had sold her soul to the devil and we were trying to administer deliverance to her and we told her she needed to address this devil and take back the place she had given him and she needed to do it by speaking directly to the devil and renouncing him. So we knelt around a coffee table, we started praying and we said, now you speak to the devil. And this woman says, dear devil. (laughs) we, We had to stop her right there and say, whoa, wait, this is not resisting the devil. You don't resist the devil by saying, dear devil, please leave me alone. You've got to resist the devil. God gave you power and authority and you have to activate that by stirring yourself up, becoming violent in your heart and just putting your spiritual foot down and saying, Satan, get out of my life. And you know what? There's probably some people watching this program or listening by radio. They're saying, well, I'm just not an assertive type of person. Well, then die, suffer. I know some people think that's terrible, but I'm just trying to be blunt with you. This is what God said. And if you don't take your authority and you just write it off to, well, this isn't my personality type, well, then change. Get rid of it or suffer because that's the way that it works. God is not going to rebuke the devil for you. You have to stand up. You have to resist the devil. And if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. See, God gave you this authority and you can't beg God to do what he's asked you to do or told you to do. It won't work. This is why so many people are not seeing the manifestations of the things that they desire because they don't understand what we have and they don't know that they have authority over it and they're asking God to do what he told us to do. You know, I think I used this example earlier in the teaching, but it bears repeating. And I think it's a good example about Kenneth Hagin, who had the Lord appear to him. The Lord was giving him instructions, and this little devil ran in between them and started jumping and yelling and making a noise. And he tried to pay attention, look around this demon, and yet he couldn't really uh, focus on what the Lord was saying. And Kenneth Hagin said that he wondered why the Lord was allowing this to go on. It's just exactly like a lot of people today. God, why are you allowing this sickness? God, why am I poor? Why aren't things working? Finally, he just got so upset that he got mad and he said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And this little demon just, boom, was gone. And the Lord looked at him and he says, if you hadn't have done that, I couldn't have. And I know that that rubs religion the wrong way to say that there's something that God couldn't do. You could say he wouldn't do it. It doesn't matter. It's not going to get done. God's not going to violate his word. He said, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. And there are many people today that know that it's the devil that's trying to destroy your life. You know it's the devil that's trying to kill you with sickness. You know it's the devil that's stealing your prosperity from you. You know that this isn't God's will. And yet... You are praying and saying, oh God, please solve this. Oh God, please do something. You aren't taking your authority. If you are dealing with a demonic hindrance against you, then you have to step up to the plate and take the authority that God has given you and you've got to command the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves to God. See, there's two sides to this. It's like a coin. It's not a matter of you just going around and binding and rebuking anything you want. You know, some of you may think, well, it's the devil that gave me this wife and I want a new one. And so I'm taking authority and I'm commanding my new wife to come along and this one to get out of the way. You know, that's not going to happen because God didn't give you that kind of power and authority to go around getting rid of your wife and marrying another. That's not his will. 
See, you've got to submit yourselves to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. It's not just one side of this coin that you take, and you begin to start taking this truth about authority, and you're going to go out, and you're going to make everything be exactly the way you want it to. That only works when you're submitted to God. When you're submitted to God, when you are seeking God with your whole heart, then, you know what, the things that you perceive as being the devil hindering you, you can deal with those and take your authority and command those things to change. But no, I'm not talking about you just going out and willing that this person, you know, they passed you and cut in front of you. And, and, and I've heard Christians before say things like, well, man, I hope he has a wreck further on down the road. You know what? That's not going to come to pass because God didn't give you that kind of authority to curse people and to do things. You aren't submitted to God. But I'm saying when you submit yourself to God, then you can resist the devil. You can actively fight against him and he will flee from you. You know, I couldn't tell you how many, many times I've seen this exact same thing happen in my life. Man, I've got some stories about casting out demons that are something else. And it's just amazing how we get away from this. You know, let me, let me tell you this one story. I know that many of you, this is going to raise questions in your mind, but uh, it's a funny story. And if you live through it, it, makes, great, it make great, makes a great testimony. But when I was still in the Baptist church, we stumbled into casting out demons. It's a long story. I hadn't got time to go into that. But we saw a person who would have been put in a mental hospital, and we knew that it wasn't just physical, natural. It was demonic. We knew that the authorities wouldn't understand, so we locked them in a room for seven days and took shifts and sang about the blood and did what we didn't know what we were doing, and we just literally beat the devil out of this woman. Now, I'm not physically, you know, with our hands, but by singing about the blood and speaking against the devil, we just stayed in there until we saw this woman delivered of demons. She was restored to her right mind, and it became uh, something that people started coming from all over. So anyway, we had this one guy who was a homosexual, and he wanted to come and get delivered. And we didn't know what we were doing. We read this book. I won't even give you the name of this book, but don't read it anyway. It's not good. And it taught us all kinds of stuff about how you can't cast out a demon by yourself. You've got to have two people. There's no scriptural precedent for that. You've got to ask them their names. You've got to have them puke in a bucket. You got, we, we did some stupid stuff. And anyway, we had been going through. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just dealing with things the best that we could. And anyway, word got out. This homosexual came and wanted to be delivered. So we spent three weeks preparing him for deliverance, which you don't have to do. There's a group right here in Colorado Springs that you have to fill out a 40-page questionnaire, and they have a 45-day waiting period for you to get deliverance. And they think that's a godly thing to do. That's not the method that Jesus used. We had to ask them their name. I remember one time uh, Dave Duell was talking to a demon and he says, what's your name? And this demon says, liar. And he says, are you telling me the truth? <laughs> it's just amazing the things that people do. And anyway, we were prepping this guy and he finally came on a Wednesday night to my Baptist church. And the guy who was the associate pastor who helped me cast out devils was gone to a conference. So I was there by myself. So an usher came and got me out of the service and said, this guy wants to see you. I went back and saw him and there was him and another homosexual who wanted to get delivered too. And he says, I'm ready to get delivered tonight. And I said, well, you can't do it. I'm by myself. And he says, well, I'm not leaving with these demons. And I said, well, I'm not casting them out. And he says, you better do something because I'm getting rid of these demons. So I took this guy into a back room in a Baptist church. And I was back there talking to him. And I took Jamie with me. She wasn't my wife at the time. Uh, we were just in a Bible study together. And she wasn't even spirit-filled at the time. And so uh, she didn't know what she was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. And anyway, we took this guy back there and he says, you better plead the blood over this place or do something because these demons are coming out. So I started praying. I said, and I just said, Father, in the name of Jesus. And when I started praying, this guy fell out on the floor and began to bark and slither like a snake and started taking chairs and throwing them against this glass wall. And I mean, it was quite a commotion. And the usher he heard this, and he went in and stopped the service, and he said, uh, we need to pray for Andrew. He's back there witnessing to somebody. They didn't have a clue what was going on. So anyway, 
I didn't know what to do. And this other demon-possessed guy, there was a stack of chairs. They were stacked, you know, about 10 on top of each other. And this demon-possessed guy was up on top of the chairs, up against the wall, (laughs) plastered against the wall, scared him to death. Jamie was over there praying, doing everything she needed to do. And so anyway, I, I just was in it. And so I started saying, what's your name? What's your name? Tell me your name in the name of Jesus. And as I was going through this, one demon had named itself. And then another one. And I felt like, man, I was being made a fool of. I didn't know if the first demon had come out before the second one had named himself. And it was just silly. It was, it was ridiculous. And finally, I just had this scripture come to me where Jesus commanded them to hold their peace and come out of him. And I thought, well, that would be a good thing. So I just said, in the name of Jesus, I command you all to shut up and come out of this guy. And boom, just like that, this guy was laying on the floor just like he was dead. And I went up and kind of shook him to see if he was okay. And he just rolled over and he says, I'm free. I'm delivered. I'm free. And I thought, man, why did I go through all this other stuff if it was as simple as commanding them to come out in the name of Jesus? And see, here's the illustration. The reason I use that is because we stumbled into this. We didn't know what we were doing. And we used to beg and plead and ask, oh, God, please get rid of this. And I learned through doing that, you know what? God gave me authority over the devil. And I don't have to go through this stuff. I don't have to ask them their name. I don't have to have them fill out a 40-page questionnaire. I don't have to wait three or four weeks and get them ready. I have authority over the devil. And if the person is willing to cooperate, I can go in and command and those demons will obey me. But see, I I can't ask God to cast the devil out and to do what God told me to do. I have to take my authority and I have to stand up and I have to know that when I speak that it's going to work. I have to have faith in that. And I tell you, if you just take these few little things that we've been saying... Understand that when God gives you power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, that you have a responsibility that comes with this, that you have to exercise it. You can't go back to God and beg God to do what He commanded you to do. You have to take your authority and use it. And if you would just make those simple adjustments that I've been talking about, begin to start speaking to your problems. Man, begin to start commanding the Word of God to works. Pray the Word of God across people's paths when they need to be born again. If you would start, instead of begging for a move of God, stand up and begin to start going out and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, do what the Word of God says, you would start seeing the power of God in manifestation. I tell you, there is not a problem with God. Prayer works. It's just wrong prayer doesn't work. You got to pray in line with the authority that God's given you. You can't be asking God to do what He told you to do. Man, these are awesome truths. I tell you, I think that this has the potential of just revolutionizing your walk with the Lord. It could make a big, big difference.